Good morning, New Life. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I want to welcome those of you who are in the room. Feel free to stand. Those of you at home, my name is Dan Trell. I'll be filling in for Pastor Kate, who is on a well-deserved rest. We love Pastor Kate. Give her, give her a hand. So this morning, we're going to be singing some songs of praise, songs of gratitude. I want to encourage you, stretch out. We're going to start by singing about the glorious day that the Lord called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen? Yeah, feel free to move. I already see some of you moving. Oh, you can give a clap if you like. Let's sing this song. Said I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Yeah, you got it. Said I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide it was my tune till I met you come on we're gonna sing this say you call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the dark out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the dark, out of the into your, let me see you clap your hands. Let's sing, now your mercy, now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom, now your freedom is all I know. The old may new, the old may new. Jesus, when I met you, come on, new life. You call my name. What do we do? And I ran out of that grave. We came out of that grave. Out of the You call my name My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the end. To your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that pain, out of the darkness. Into your glorious day, your glorious day, your glorious day. We came out of that grave. a shot of praise we came out of that grave you caught us out of the dark into the marvelous light thank you oh this morning we're so thankful that he called us out he has made us new 
the Lord is continuing to make a way. Amen? And we're so grateful that that way was not just a rescue plan, but that way was found in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. So as we sing this song, we sing thankful, we sing grateful that our Lord is continuing to make a way, even today, even now. Thank you, Jesus.
God is continually making a way. Even when we can't see it, may our heart come to trust that truth. Not only is he with us, he's making a way. He never leave us or forsake us. Amen. So as we sing today, we fix our, our posture upward, letting our praises rise, thanking the Lord. Not only that he called us out of that grave, but that he's making a way, he's restoring us, he's sanctifying us. So let us sing this song of praise to him. Thank you, him. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. 
Every time I gather and worship on a Sunday morning, that's the prayer of my heart. And what a prayer for us to lift up before the Lord. All I want is for you, to, for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted high. Throughout the course of the week, my heart gets so distracted, my mind gets so distracted, and Sundays are a point of recentering our hearts and recentering our minds that we would live into that song and live into that prayer, all I want. It was St. Augustine who said, those who sing pray twice. And so let's continue to just pray twice. And as we sing that chorus there, all I want is for you. And as we sing that, Julie, wouldn't you lead us in that? And as Julie leads us in that, let's just lift our hearts and lift our voices to the Lord. Lift our hands before him in his presence. May that be the prayer of our hearts. Julie, won't you lead us in that? Lift our voices. All I want is for you, for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted. Lift it up before the Lord. We sing those words not as a means of escaping the realities of the world, but to discern God's presence in the midst of the world. This past week, there's been a lot happening in the world. This past month, this past year, this past year and a half, there's been so much happening where we need a greater awareness of the presence of God in our midst. When we worship, we are not brought into God's presence. We're got, we brought into awareness of God's presence. And we need a greater awareness, a heightening of God's presence in our own individual lives. And as we look at what's happening in the world, this past week, 13 U.S. soldiers were killed in Afghanistan. Countless other Afghan men, women, and children have been killed. There's a hurricane headed towards Louisiana right now as I speak. Countless people are having their lives ravaged by COVID-19. There's just so much going on in the world where we just need to lift our voices in prayer and in intercession and opening our heart before the living God to say, Lord, all we want is for you, for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted high. And so as a means of intercession, let's just sing that song again. And that's our prayer of intercession as we think about uh, Afghanistan, as we think about what's happening in different states, as we think about Louisiana. Lord, all we want for you is to be glorified, to be lifted high. Let's continue to sing that out. That's our prayer of intercession this Sunday. All we want. Let's sing that together. That's our prayer. Let's sing that out. Lord over Afghanistan. Oh. Over Louisiana. Over Florida, Mississippi, the United States. Let's sing it out. Over our marriages. Over our workplace. All we want is for you, for you to be glorified, you to be lifted up. All we want is for you, for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted up. 
That's our prayer this day, Lord. And Lord, in your presence, we recognize that we fall short so much, that we are in need of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so we pray this prayer of confession as we do every single Sunday, reminding us of how much we need your grace and how much we need to offer your grace to the world around us. As the people of God, let's pray this prayer of confession as we do every single Sunday, receiving the grace of God together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and our neighbor through our own fault, in thought, in word, in deed, in what we have done, in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name, amen. Before you sit down, turn around, maybe greet a neighbor or two, fist bump, elbow, wave high, and all that stuff there. And those of you watching online, so wonderful to have you. Say hello on the chat section. It is good to have you with us in worship. Good morning, New Life Fellowship Church. What a gift to see you all in worship. Want to welcome those of you watching online, whether you're watching from newlife.nyc, whether you're watching from Facebook, whether you're watching from YouTube. Uh, we are thrilled that you are with us. For those of you visiting here, for those of you watching online, my name is Rich. I'm the lead pastor of New Life in Queens, New York City. And uh, what a joy it is to worship with you. At the end of our service, for those of you in the room, I'll be outside on the porch area. If we've never met, please be sure to introduce yourself. Maybe you've been coming to New Life for the past few weeks. I've been uh, on vacation here and there, uh, and now I am back. And so I'd love to meet you, especially if we've never met and uh, if this is your first time here with us. There's just a couple of things I want you to be made aware of before we receive our offering. The first is that uh, this fall, uh, we are kind of revving back up here in terms of ministry as a whole. Uh, school is starting again, and so we have some very wonderful plans for our kids' ministry, our elementary, our pre-K, our middle school. School. And so we are actually looking for volunteers. I've received emails over the past couple of months from new lifers who have asked me when we get back into day to day and week to week ministry in person, is there any way that I can serve? And this is one wonderful opportunity where you can serve, where our children uh, need connection and need pastors in their lives. And we have a small group model at New Life where we want to connect children into smaller communities. If you have that sense where if something is, uh, you want to offer your gifts to serve our community, you can email uh, nextgen at newlife.nyc. We'd love to get you connected. And if you just want more information on what's happening in our midst, feel free to email our team and we would love to follow up with you. In addition to that, just related to this next Sunday, we're not going to have any elementary or pre-K ministry. We're giving our volunteers and our staff a break today and next week. And then we're going to gear up right after that, beginning September 12th, uh, for some really wonderful ministry not just for our adults, but for our kids also. As we prepare to take our offering, just want you to know that one of the ways that we are able to continue the good work that we're doing at New Life is because of your generosity. And as a pastor of this community here, I've been so grateful for the ways that you New Lifers in this room here and those of you watching online have continued to be faithful in your giving. There are many congregations throughout our city, throughout our nation, that are really struggling for various reasons. And our congregation has had the great privilege and blessing of being able to continue our ministry without really any kind of hiccups because of your generosity. And so the work that we do in the fall and in the winter and as spring comes really happens because of God's faithfulness through your generosity. And so every week we have this kind of liturgy, this opportunity to pray. There are various ways to give, whether you give online or you give via text or in the back of the room here there's a couple of boxes that if you just want to donate something, you can do that at the end of our service. Uh, I am just so grateful for your generosity. With that said, let's pray the prayer of, of generosity as we do it week in and week out together. Father, you are an abundant giver. There is nothing that I have that you have not given me. The way of your kingdom is the way of generosity. Help us to honor you with our resources. 
Free us from the deceit of riches. Lead us on the path of generosity. For your glory, Lord, for the abundance of our own lives and for the sake of others. Amen. This Pastor Rich shared just a list of things that are going on in our world. From hurricanes to the pandemic. And the truth is that we know that those things can bring up worries and doubt. So this morning I'm going to sing a, a, a song. It actually comes from a lament psalm. And I'm so grateful that uh, the scriptures give us a language when we're in times like now. And I preface the song to say, as I, as I play and sing this song, first, my prayer is that your heart would be encouraged. Second, if you need to stand, feel free to stand. If you need to sit, feel free to sit. If you need to journal, feel free to journal. But let this song, let the words uh, prove to be an honest reflection of our hearts and know that um, gratitude and doubt, they're not polar opposites, but both can be pathways towards hope when submitted back to God. Amen. So I pray that as I sing this song that it encourages your heart and prepare our hearts for the message. Oh Yahweh, do you see me? My faith is at a crossroad, so much for me to comprehend, even more that I don't understand. Like, why does it seem that those who speak against your name, they go stronger in their pride, use violence with no shame? When will your mighty hand bring judgment and there fall so many questions that I have and I haven't shared them all because lord my heart is stuck between hope and despair and i'm hanging on by a thread my mind is entangled on the worries ahead how my soul groans i'm feeling lost and abandoned in this world full of chaos and at times i feel hopeless and your presence feel absent help my soul to find stillness in you I've not trusted the way that I should, oh Lord, I admit that. I've even questioned your goodness in the wake of grave injustice. Because I'm prone to trust in what I see, a lot of pain and misery, conflicting thoughts are taking hold of me. Forget to call upon your name Instead I accuse and place to blame Forgive me and revive my soul again For when my heart is stuck Between hope and despair And I'm hanging on by a thread When my mind is entangled On the worries ahead I'm reminded That whether grieved or rejected Perplexed or dejected, I can tune my heart to the sound of your truth, and then my soul will find stillness in. Cause you're not scared of the thoughts in my mind, so I place my doubt in your hands. And when I struggle with all that I feel, you remind me. The weather grieved or rejected. Perplexed or dejected, I can tune my heart to the sound of your truth. Then my soul will find stillness in. Cause you're not scared of the thoughts in my mind. So I place my doubt in your hands. And when I struggle with all that I see, you remind me. 
Whether grieved or rejected, stretched or dejected, whether grieved or rejected, stretched or dejected, whether grieved or rejected, stretched or dejected, I can tune my heart to the sound of your truth, then my soul will find stillness, find stillness in you. Stillness in you. Amen. Thank you, Dontrell. What a what a great gift. On on Sundays, it's very easy to uh, praise God in such a way where we ignore our doubts and all the rest there. But Dontrell gave us a great gift that we bring all these things before the Lord in worship. And how ironic as he's singing at the end there, we got a fire truck passing by there. I'm just like, this is Queens, New York City. Here we are. Before Drew comes up to preach here, I actually, uh, I missed an opportunity to invite a couple of people on the stage here uh, that all of you, uh, many of you know and love here. So every uh, month or so, we've been trying to introduce various leaders or new lifers uh, on the stage here to give you a sense of who they are and what they're up to. I wanted to ask Belinda and Carmen if they can come up here and share a little bit of what's happening within their community. Give it up for Belinda and Carmen as they come up on the stage here. Good morning, New Life family. Um, I'm so grateful to be here today. My name is Carmen Galindo, and I have the opportunity to co-direct the Latter Rain 50-plus community. Good morning, New Life family. My name is Belinda Mendez, and it is my privilege and an honor to co-direct with Carmen the, the Latter Rain 50-plus community. So, a shout out to all of those that are Ladder Rain participants. So, Ladder Rain is a um, community of folks in New Life that are 50 years and older. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see my notes. So, um, <laughs> to, we, in our hopes, is to connect people um, just to have a good time together. But um, we want to build a community that is fruitful in those latter rain years that we are experiencing. So I have to continue here. So in the past, we had um, wonderful events, special trips, karaoke night, and many Christmas parties to bring people together. And we are... No, Okay, so during the pandemic, we were a little challenged, as were so many others. But we managed to have events to connect our community. We had guest speakers, we played games, we even had prizes, and fun was had by all over Zoom. Yeah, can you imagine us old folks having a hangout time on Zoom, well, we did it. And it was successful. We finally met in person for the first time at our summer party, which was a lot of fun, wasn't it, Carmen? It sure was. Wow. <laughs> Let's just say, we old folks over 50, we love to have fun enjoy ourselves, and we like to share it with our family and our friends. So, um, we're looking forward to um, an exciting Christmas party this year. We always have exciting Christmas parties with plenty of food. Um, and we have a few, um, we have a few ideas up our sleeves for next year. So we are inviting you to come and join our ladder rain if you haven't done yet. Um, and we hope to just get some more participants this year just to um, get together. The word for this year, it's together. 
Okay, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Carmen and Belinda. Uh, what, a, what a gift. On Zoom, having a party on Zoom. There we go. Um, one of the gifts of New Life is not just that we are a multiracial community, multi-ethnic community, but we're also a multi-generational community. And that's one of the great gifts of our congregation. Uh, so thank you, Belinda and Carmen. They'll be outside, I'm sure, at the end of our service here if you want to connect with them or if you have any questions about this particular uh, community. I want to introduce to you our guest speaker. Next week, I'll be continuing our series on spiritual disciplines. I'll be preaching next week on fasting. Woo, fasting. Uh, some of you are like, I'm going to skip that Sunday. Uh, <laughs> Come to church, all right? I think I have a good word for you on fasting next week here. Uh, but I'm thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Drew Hyun. Drew is a church planter and pastor at uh, Hope Church Midtown, as well as the founding pastor of the Hope Church New York City uh, family of churches, which is really maybe about eight or nine churches at this point, Drew, uh, throughout uh, New York City. Uh, Drew has spent the last uh, 16 years uh, living, maybe more than that, uh, pastoring in New York. Uh, he loves uh, cities, ESPN, uh, and naps. Uh, and he finds a restful Sabbath when all three come together. Uh, he resides in New York City with his lovely wife, Tina. They have a son named David and a uh, beautiful daughter, Avery. Now, that's Drew's formal bio, but let me give an informal bio here. Uh, Drew served as a pastor of New Life Fellowship Church for 10 years. And um, you, you cannot understand New Life Fellowship without the presence and leadership of Drew Hyun. It's impossible. New Life is just over 30 years old. Drew is with us for a third of that of our lifespan, and you cannot understand new life and what new life is today without the tireless leadership and service that Drew offered for over a decade. And so, whether through small group ministry, whether through leading retreats, whether through preaching, whether through uh, funerals and weddings, uh, Drew has been all over the place at New Life and has touched so many lives. And this is the first time that he's preaching on a Sunday morning in a decade, in a decade. Now, this, and he's actually the first person outside of our preaching team to preach on a Sunday since the pandemic started, which is really fitting and I think is really beautiful. And so typically whenever we have a so-called guest speaker that comes and we introduce them, our tradition at New Life is not to go, oh, we have a guest speaker and a little pitter-patter here and I hope it's good and all that stuff there. No, we show gracious hospitality and exuberance whenever we have a guest. And, and Drew is more than a guest. He's a son of this house. He's a brother to us. And so give it up for Drew Hyun as he comes up to preach. to be here. Um, I, uh, yeah, in, in a decade, I haven't been back on a Sunday. I've been back for different gatherings, and um, uh, it's just been such an honor. I've been a bit of a weepy mess here in the beginning of the service, um, just worshiping with what feels like family to me. And so whether you like it or not, you have a son who's been running around in Manhattan, and you may have not <laughs> known that I am a son of yours, but this congregation has meant so much to me. Uh, I wanna thank Pastor Rich, as well as Pastor Jackie, and so many of the staff and the elders here, and Pete and Jerry, and their investment in my life. I would not be where I am without you, and so in many ways, I feel in message. You know, um, Rich invited me, sorry for any Staten Island people. I love Staten Island, I love Staten Island. Uh, or maybe I don't, but nonetheless, uh, but you can imagine, it's like from this place where people would think, with well, Nazareth? That's where, who is this person from Nazareth? What good can come from Nazareth? In fact, that's, those are the kinds of words that people would make about this person, Jesus. So if you can imagine, even in today's world, it's almost like the United States. We would think that the world changers, the ones who would start movements that would flip this world upside down, of course, they would come from this country. But it's, it, instead, it's kind of, if you can imagine today, like there's a peasant farmer somehow in like, Nepal or something like that, in this small country 
where somehow a movement would spread that would end up changing the world. That's really what the equivalent of today, of, of, of what this Christian movement was. Now, what's so extraordinary, if you look in the early church, because Jesus basically resurrects from the grave, and slowly the message of Jesus begins to spread, but it spreads in the midst of incredibly difficult circumstances. Persecution. Not only persecution for myself, but persecution for my family. So people were basically told, if you say Jesus is Lord instead of Caesar is Lord, then your family and the people that you love will be killed. Now, I want to show you this chart, though. There's this chart of the early church. Now, look at the statistics of the early Christian church and how it grows in the midst of what's incredibly difficult circumstances. In AD 40, so after Jesus resurrects from the grave, he appears to over 500 people, and estimates are that there's about 1,000 Christians during this time. Now, during that time, emperors would get word of this small movement of Christian faith that's growing, And Nero and other emperors would basically be like, ah, who are these people? We'll just snuff them out with our military. We'll just persecute them. But look at what happens just 60 years later, 100 AD. The population in the midst of intense persecution and pain would actually grow to 7,000 to 10,000 in 100 AD. Now, one century later, in 200 AD, in the midst of even more intense persecution, people dying for their faith, burning at the stake, under intense persecution. Look at what happens in 200 AD. The estimated Christian population, as this minority group, undergoing intense persecution and suffering, it actually grows to 200,000. Isn't that unbelievable? Now look at what happens. Between 200 AD to 300 AD, there's the Decian persecution, which is known as one of the most vicious persecutions of Christians. And it culminates in in 303 AD, there's the great persecution where Christians would again be incredibly uh, persecuted and undergo suffering and trial. But look at what happens in the midst of the bloodiest kind of century for the Christians, it goes from 200,000 to five to six million. Isn't that unbelievable? And the question I want to ask today is how in the world did this happen? especially in the most difficult, suffering, painful circumstances. How in the world does this Christian movement not only just survive, but actually thrives and takes off? Now, one of the clues, we see this in the early church writings. So, for instance, the apostle Peter, who's a disciple of Jesus. Look at what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 when he's writing to churches that are suffering in Asia Minor. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Can I hear you say living hope? hope. Yeah, it's not like some limping hope. It's not some kind of dead hope. It's actually alive. It's vital. It moves. It flourishes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is given in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God. I love that image. Shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Can I hear you say greatly rejoice? Though now for a little while you may may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So he's not minimizing the fact that we suffer. He's saying, I want to tell you about this kind of faith. That even in the midst of difficult circumstances where you might experience grief and loss and lament, I want to tell you about this living hope. This living hope that's available to you and to me. You see, and when Peter is writing to the early church that's suffering, he's basically talking about something that in the midst of the darkest valley could actually empower the people of God to walk through with this living hope. Now, if you know anything about the story of Peter you know that his story is just this amazing one as well. Because Peter was this fisherman who was a follower of Jesus, and you probably know basically his highlight reel, what he's most well known for, was basically how he failed miserably. So for instance, here's the story. If you look in the Gospel of Mark, which is a historical account, it says Jesus is basically, before he dies, he says to to his disciples, you will all fall away 
Jesus told them. He didn't have much faith in his disciples there. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So Jesus is basically saying, listen, all of you guys are going to fall away. That doesn't mean he doesn't believe in them because he's, they're still his plan A. Now look at how Peter responds. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Right? Like, like you can almost see him. Like his, his bravado. And look at what Jesus does. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. You would think that Peter would be like, Lord, really? Like, tell, tell me more. But instead, Peter insisted emphatically to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Right? Like, like He's like arguing with Jesus here. And all the others said the same. Now, a few verses later, check out what happens to Peter. While Peter was below in the courtyard, Jesus gets arrested. He's on the way towards his death. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked close at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. All of a sudden, this bravado is lost. He says, I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing, this fellow is one of them. And look at what happens. Uh, Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Now, isn't this extraordinary? Here's Peter who had been following Jesus for about, you know, for about three years. And, and Peter, in this situation, he's incredibly full of shame. He's weeping bitterly because he's really lost all hope. Now, what's so extraordinary is that this same Peter is the same Peter who would write that later to the letter to the church in Asia Minor, basically saying, we've got this gathering in the power of the Holy Spirit with a living hope deep down in your soul. And may you offer that hope to a hopeless world around you. I bless you all in the strong, in the beautiful, in the hopeful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said... Amen. Grace and peace to you all.